Okay, let me start the recording. I'll share my screen. All right, so we're going to start in my Prezi. So basically, it's videos um, in education. We're taking all the content from the books and starting to pretty much redo the whole educational process and doing videos um, for pretty much everything. All right. Hang on. Yeah, I get a redo. Okay, video has become an important part of education. Why? Let's find out. Video in education is very important. Uh, so we're going to find out why. It's integrated as part of traditional courses now. Serves as a cornerstone of many of the traditional courses. A lot of courses are no longer um, classroom based or textbooks based. Um, a lot of them are going over the web, doing video, doing sound, doing all multimedia learning. Technology can also enhance the learning, especially with um, students with disabilities, which I'll get into that in a little bit later. Um, and video can be a highly effective tool, again, for the students that are learning disabled. They tend to understand things better when it's presented in front of them. Um, they can see it, they can hear it. We'll get into more of that in a little bit. Okay, there are three widely accepted types of learning styles according to Pruitt and Miller, 2005 and 2001. The first one is aptitude-based. This draws on Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. The theory of multiple intelligences differentiates intelligences into specific modalities, other than seeing intelligence as dominated by a single general ability. Howard Gardner proposed this model in 1983 book, Brains of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. According to the theory, an intelligence must fulfill eight criteria, musical, bodily, visual, interpersonal, verbal, intrapersonal, logical, and naturalistic. Next, we're going to move into personality based. Myers and Briggs type indicator personality types in learning, um, MBTI for short. We have extrovert, we have thinking, we have introvert, we have feeling, we have sensing, perceiving, intuitive, and judging. And there is no right or wrong to these preferences. Each identifies normal human behaviors and characteristics. Um, so we're all different. We all learn different. And this is, again, corner 2005 and Miller 2001. Next, we have sensory-based intelligence. Looks into the mod modalities through which students take in information. Three primary process through which people take in information are visual, auditory, tactile. And this comes from Silverman, 2006. Next, we're gonna go on to how do we decide on our video content? Selecting an effective video is an essential component of integrating this video into practice and realizing the promise of multimedia in the classroom. One of the most significant factors in the success or failure of an educational technology is the quality of the content rather than the technology itself. Selecting video that has strong, visual rich educational content is a critical element for maximizing effectiveness, especially with students with um, learning disabilities. Next, it must provide visual demonstrations or evidence of what the teacher is teaching. And they must dramatize events and concepts. And it must also appeal to the emotions of the students. If it can't appeal to the emotions of the students, 
most likely your students aren't going to remember it and they're not going to want to go back to it. This is from Line Barger 2003. Next we have, how does research support the use of video in the classroom? Okay. Hey James, I just want to make sure you leave time for your demos and stuff. So yep. you know you might want to go faster. Because that'll take a while to explain, and that's like your project. This okay. is all valuable, and we know you we know you have this. Okay, so I'll skip ahead then. Yeah, well, I th I just want to make sure you have plenty of time because it's okay. going to be tight. So yeah, if you could. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Okay. Yeah. Do, do. Again, you can follow really quick in uh, TillyWiki. Now, this is going to lean into the project, why it was developed. What are the current problems for educators when making effective content? Okay, first one is outdated equipment. expensive software, and no technical knowledge. It requires a team. The outdated equipment, as we found out from the studio at SUNY Poly, it looks like it's from the 80s. And this goes into poorly produced videos. This was our first attempt of producing a um, online educational video with quality content using the school's resources. So I'll just play a quick sample. Okay, so yeah, let's pull up, um, okay, you're now recording. So and as you can see, there's a lot of work that the instructors okay. so have to do. So, um, yeah, um, the quality is not there, and you can't move around the content. Patients too, just to see it. Okay. Next, we have software. We have Zoom, which is expensive per user. We have Jing. Um, which they do offer a free one, but makes the video pretty much useless because it records it in a flash file. And most educators have no technical knowledge in video production. Traditional studios require at least five people to man them. And this brings us into how do we solve these problems? What questions should we ask? Can we develop and create an effective video recording tool to help assist educators in making compelling educational videos Will the system be able to stream live educational content over the internet? And it brings us to video and a podcast, or video podcast in a box tool that I created um, from the ground up. A low cost and effective tool to produce compelling educational videos. Why was this tool developed? Working as um, Dr. Snyder's um, graduate assistant, he came to me, told me he wanted to record educational videos. Um, he had what he wanted to do with it. So he sent me on a mission to try to find out how to do it. Um, I went to the SUNY IT studio and found out that we couldn't use the equipment. So I did a little bit of thinking and we came up with something better. And this is the traditional videos that we've all been used to. We all see them. Word. And good morning, Jeremy, how are you? Good morning, Steve. I'm very well, thank you. Although it's late afternoon. As you can see, nothing's moving, everything's static. Um, again, the professor has to drive the content and pretty much be the producer as they go. So we developed and created a better tool. It originally started as a um, program for video gamers to record their content and talk over it at the same time. I took that concept, developed it, and pushed it farther by making um, podcasts in a box. And this is one of the videos that we created using it. Hi, folks. I can't believe we are at the end. It's almost mid. It is almost mid with, so uh, with this go ahead. technology. So the content can zoom in and out. We can go back to each of the professors. We had two cameras. Um, they're no longer uh, producing it, so it frees up their time, finished. makes the videos run a lot smoother. Smoother videos mean happy students. So what research method was used? I use observational method field research. So that means prolonged engagement. This 
whole process took me over a year and a half because each time I kept coming up with something, Dr. Schneider would throw in a, a little wrench and want to do other stuff. So I had to figure out how to do those things and keep him happy while developing the system. So we clearly express self-conscious notations of how observing is done. Um, I was the one driving everything. I saw what was work, working, wrote it down, what wasn't working, wrote it down, and made adjustments on the fly as needed. Methodological and tactile and provisions in order to develop a full understanding of the system. And what are, are our deliverables? We produced over 200 educational videos that are on the YouTube channel that I control. Over 60 of the educational videos were live streamed over YouTube for a class. And I created a 35 page electronic instructional manual that will help any professor or anybody that wants to learn the system, how to do it, what supplies they need, the cost of the supplies, and how to run everything step by step. And a complete fully functional system, which can be viewed down at the SUNY Poly TV studio if it's still up and running. So that brings us to educational videos of why they're important. Okay. Answers to the questions. Can we develop and create an effective video recording tool to help assist educators in making compelling educational videos? Yes. This total system cost us under $1,000 for the college. Um, all we had to get was two cameras, a microphone. We had to get a video card and a bunch of other wires and it became a really good tool. We can actually take a live stream from a Zoom session, feed it into this and broadcast live and record at the same time, two different feeds and switch back and forth like each one was actually in the same location. Will the system be able to stream live educational content over the internet? Yes, we proved that by doing over 60 educational videos for um, Gretchen's class, which each student had to run a five minute video and they had to do three of them about topics and it was live streamed over the YouTube channel and Gretchen can communicate back and forth between the students all through the using this system. Okay, any questions? I'm sure there's a lot. Can you like show us what this thing looks like? Like, where's the box? Um, it's like, or, in the or, or describe the equipment that's involved. Okay, let me um pull it up. And maybe it's in the manual, right? Yes, it's all in the manual. Yeah. So maybe you could show us that manual and walk us through some of that part. Yep, that's what I planned on doing. Okay. Oh, you asked for questions. So that was my question. Okay. So it's broken down. This is probably the 20th revision of this. Every time I kept coming up with it. We're uh, seeing your Prezi, Jay. We're still in the Prezi, oh. yeah. Sorry about that. You need somebody to produce videos for you. Yes. <laughs> we should be using the podcast in a box for our thesis presentations. I tried to and he told me no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 yeah, well, it's because he hasn't seen, we haven't demoed it yet, so. Okay, so now you can see the tiddlywicky, right? Yep. All right, so we enter it. So table contents, we're going to go straight to the manual. It's broken down in sections, adding assets, audio settings, broadcast settings, capture devices, equipment setup, and so forth. Um, then we have the software setup, which is the main component. Driving factor, we have the recording. Okay, let me turn on some displays. We have how to set up um, the filters, the source list. Then we go to step four, the list of effect filters, scene transitions, takes everyone step by step on how to do it. Um, the preview area, this is what the preview area would look like. Um, all the other stuff up here, there's really no pictures for it. It's all text-based. Then we go to number six and go into edit mode. Shows the user how to get to the screen. 
um, tells the user what each of components that are up on the screen will do and tells them how to do it. Then we have the quick start guide, which if they're already familiar with the system, but they forgot something, they can use a quick start guide and easily go through it to refresh their memory. Okay. Close these down. Then we have the equipment set up. No, we're gonna go with required equipment. So all required equipment requires one PC to operate, um, will not operate on a Mac, gives the minimum specifications that you would need to run the system, um, gives you the link to download the free software, obsproject.com. Okay. Then we have the equipment set up, which I have a nice little diagram. Shows the PC, shows where the first webcam would go, second webcam, microphone, and the video capture box in the rear. In the front, we have the keyboard and mouse. <laughs> okay, then we have capture devices. We have monitor capture, which again shows the picture of what's on the screen and shows what each of these selections do and how to do it. Okay, then we have your required equipment, which we already did. Then we have the recommended layout, which we used in the studio to get the optimal performance. Um, we have camera one, camera two, microphone in the middle, the talent on each side, a laptop over here for one of the instructors to drive, a HDMI DHCP stripper. Um, we won't go into details of that one for obvious reasons. Um, cables to stretch over 25 to 50 feet. The video capture box, which goes in to the laptop. If you have a PC, you don't need the HDMI DHCP stripper. If you have a Mac, you need a stripper to strip out some information so that the system can read it. Then we have the computer control center. We only need one person to operate the whole system. And when you call it podcast in a box, the idea was that you actually don't need the studio. Correct. Yeah, so this is just. This, you could carry this into a classroom or into an office. Correct. Yep. Yep. This is just the uh, operator. Yeah, that was just a setup we used in the studio. That's why it says um, yeah. recommended layout. Doesn't say required right. layout. But, but the concept of the podcast in a box is that this is a system that yes, could it's, theoretically it's, could be put in a, you know, on a card on a box and, you know, with an operator. And so it's different yep. than just turning on Zoom, but you end up with different things. Correct. Yeah, this is, um, system's totally portable, which can go from room to room, location to location. Um, I tested out one day driving in my car with the system using a laptop and that worked fine. What were you doing? Driving in the car with it, testing it out. Live streaming um, from the car? Live streaming from the car to another person on an iPhone, um, going back and forth and live broadcasting it at the same time, using the cell phone towers. Mm, interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Then we have the video can settings. Us, can you show us the videos that you captured for um, Gretchen's class, and then we can throw it open to just like one of them, and then yep. we can throw that open to questions. Okay. Because you also have a catalog of all the videos you've created here. Correct. Okay, so we have the videos recorded using Podcast in a Box. So we have the IDT 507 videos, the Talking Hypertextually videos, and the Universal Principles of Design videos, which was um, Gretchen's course. So I have them sorted by um, topics and by students. So I'll just randomly pick one. Closure. And this was actually live broadcasted over YouTube. Um, so I didn't have to do no editing, didn't have to do no uploads. It was already there on the system. And I'll play that for you really quick. Hello, my name is Devin Durier, and I'm here to talk to you about closure. Closure, as defined by your textbook, is, your, is the ability of your mind to ignore white space and to see several different elements in one solid homogeneous piece. 
it's an incredibly powerful tool in the creation of logos and images because it forces so your that's mind. one of the sample videos out of a lot of them um, but the most video that was really fun to do and challenging was gotta find it Talking hypertextually, which that's 2016, 2017 I This one we actually brought a live feed in from England. Okay, good morning, Jerry. And How ran it today? through the system with me uh, switching, just, so nobody had to worry about content or produce it. This is a the second episode of our podcast as part of the Design Light Studio for the spring 2017. This gentleman right over here, he's actually in England, uh, and, and today, this gentleman right here is we're in the United States in the studio. Our discussion on Vandendorp. And so Vandendorp, um, his book that we're talking about is called From Papyrus to Hypertext. So today we're going to walk through. Go and we can switch, so go to full screen when just one person's talking. Navigating um, Wikipedia, for instance, um, so how writing arose and how it's different. Then we can go and we can fade into the next one. When this person talks, we can fade back out to both of them talking and going over the contact. So just, um, so James, we only have seven minutes left. So I want to go yep. with questions and I just want to say one thing and then let everyone else talk too. But, um, having someone do that makes all the difference in the world trying to do that when you're teaching is really hard so having that extra person in that setup is unbelievable so i'd highly recommend it if you ever want to do those things so thanks james the question you're welcome <clears throat> You know, um, James, I just wanted to check. You haven't actually had someone else do this yet, have you? I think this is sort of a pilot, so you're... Serious. No. Um, actually, Michelle did um, a lot of the ones for Gretchen. She ran them herself with me watching after I trained her. Uh -huh. So Michelle does have the manual in print format. She does know how to use the system. Um, I know Gretchen requested the system to be used again for this semester. Um, if it actually got used for this semester from Gretchen, I have no idea because no one ever got back to me. Mm -hmm. But it is there, and um, one of the goals for having James do it was to both build it, and then part of the concept was that he did it in the studio so that he could leave it behind. Yep. Um, you know, part of his project was not evaluating the institutional effectiveness of that strategy, though. That would be... <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you know that's up to us yeah no i didn't i didn't think so but i i just was wondering and, and yeah it will be interesting to you know basically it'd be great if we could just have tas do this from here on out you know you just it's part of, of what yeah we get it's a little it's a little complicated and requires being on campus but i think the um appropriate people to do it actually might not be well, we should go to James' thesis, but might more likely be our undergraduate CID students than graduate IDT students. Well, actually, Steve, I um, developed a way to do it off location now. Really? Yes. Wow. It's, that... it's a little bit more expensive because you need a little bit more equipment, but it can be done. I've tested it myself in my studio. Hmm. You there just have to have a really fast interconnect, internet connection which that's one of the downfalls of the system, which is in the uh, theses itself. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ryan or, or Catherine, you guys have one? To... Yeah, James, I was wondering, um, once you're done, I, I mean, I've seen you at every single Zoom session I've ever attended. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering how many steps and how much time does it take for you to sort of process okay. one video? The process of video, it requires the setting up the computer for Zoom. Are we talking about Zoom? Yeah, let's, or whatever it is that you have so many of okay. here. Okay, Zoom, um, using Zoom itself takes anywhere from an hour to a few hours. Um, depends on how long the sessions are. Because after we get done recording, I have to wait for the system to convert it over to MP4 format. 
Then I have to upload to YouTube, wait for it to get done with YouTube, put it in a spreadsheet, and push it on uh, um, Dr. Snyder. Now, using um, Podcast in a Box system, it automatically pushes it to YouTube itself if you set it up that way, which is in the instruction manual on, on, how, to do, on how to do that. So the time that you put into it would be doing some titles and that kind of thing, but it doesn't take up that much time after the actual. Yeah. yeah. Yep. This is um, on the fly. You were edited on the fly, just like a real traditional um, broadcast TV studio. Mm -hmm. um, you can put your logo in the corner. You can type messages on the screen, um, mm -hmm. just like a regular TV. Okay. So first thing I want to do is thank you for doing all of this work. Cause that must've been um, and just before I finish, the one other thing I noticed, the way you started out the presentation, you were talking about learning styles, yeah. and um, some of your citations were from uh, quite a while ago, and I just wanted you to know that there's a whole um, set of research that in the past, in 2015 and 16, that seemed to be saying that that was a myth about learning styles, so in your write-up, you might want to address the fact that it's not... Um, universally accepted that there are these learning styles uh, there are a bunch of different opinions on it um okay. that's all for me hey uh, uh james I, I got i mean obviously i watched you know this this develop along um when you know steve and i's class and it just it, it was just thoroughly impressive um i mean you you sort of joked about um you know when steve would say like oh let's try this instead but you know even just what you just mentioned about you know controlling it remotely there was nothing we could throw at, at James that he wasn't able to figure out some way uh, around it and, 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 and making it so seamless and, or look seamless, I should say, on our end. It just freed uh, us. You know, I, we, had, uh, we had taught that class, team taught that class before um, and done podcasts before for it. And once James was doing that, it, we, uh, the quality in terms of not just, you know, the production values, but the educational value that we were producing. We, we, the students said that we were, we, cause we sort of jumped into a little bit more halfway in that semester, I think where we really got it going. They said like, wow, we're really, you know, this is really humming along now. And so, I, I, and I think I don't have a huge institutional memory on this, but I assume this is the most content ever created for a, an IDT thesis. I, I doubt there's much <laughs> competing uh, when you've got hundreds of videos here. Um, so it's just, it, it was, it was really incredible to watch uh, this develop. Very right, cool. Yeah. Overall, I think I got a total of 500 videos from everybody <laughs> using different systems and all the channels that I run for you guys. <clears throat> um, if we recorded it, I have it on YouTube. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's like, you know, that's, that's institutionally a really important thing for us to understand. Um, and so, and it's difficult to replicate, you know, I mean, it's a diff it's an, it's an interesting lesson that I think we should, I don't know, we'll have to share it with, um, with Rick Shelton and the online learning folks, you know, because in a sense, that's what you would, ex that's what we would want from that kind of an office, right? That just <clears throat> handle the content that we want to create on the fly. Yep. So, and yeah, and so it's really been, um, and it's really interesting too to see a thesis develop with like an institutional role, you know, and so that was good. So thanks so much. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, if you go into the intro of the thesis, it takes me step by step on our discussions with each other and the progression of all the videos from our first one all the way to the last one. Hmm. It's a little bit more detailed than. So I'm looking at your, yeah, I'll send you a note on your Tiddly Wiki because. Yep. Uh, you hide your back button <laughs> and it's going to be frustrating. Yeah. So you got to put the back button in. Yep. And playing that. Yeah. There's still a little bit more tweaking I got to do on that. So, or what you could do in the meantime is save it with your Tiddler titles in show mode instead of hide mode. And then the back button will be there. Sorry. For, so the Tiddly wiki, by the way, is James suffers through that too. So that's like yet another mode. So it's kind of cool that he, Bridges the video on the Tiddly Wiki. So, uh, Ross, back to you. It's your show. Well, I, I just actually, Dave is up, but I wanted to just mention that uh, James did amazing work on both my IDT 599. I mean, he set up, you know, that wiki that I think really is setting new standards for this course that, uh, and hopefully will drive it in new ways because, 
he both scheduled everything. He set up the assignments, the, the syncing with the sessions, the syllabus, the proposal presentations, and now these final presentations. And everything is there uh, on a moment's notice. And the turnaround time is pretty spectacular. He's also helped enormously on COM 499. I do want to say and that he's the IEP program award winner at graduate. Yeah. SMC. Good. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I, I do want to mention James did get like a TA ship, right? Yeah, Steve, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's not doing this for free, which is fine. I think otherwise it comes out as sort of slave labor. And I, I do appreciate everything. Jim pretty did. Close to it, but yes, absolutely. No, that was a, it's a, and it's an, it's an excellent illustration. I'm glad you mentioned that, mentioned that Russ, of I think a successful use of a TA ship and turning it into a thesis project. And that's like yeah. a, that's on the road to having sponsored graduate students. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It's a, it's a perfect example. Yeah. yeah, we should do that as much as we can, you know, so that's a great thing. Yeah, considering yeah. I had no theses to begin with, then um, Steve, <laughs> you're doing this, do this. It's a perfect example of a project because it's a project that helps us and moves yeah. us forward as a, as a program. And hope, maybe we'll do some, you know, uh, virtual reality in the future and, and move in different directions as so well. James, we're going to call this the Mary Poppins thesis, perfect in every way. <laughs> <laughs> no way. But we, move, we should move to uh, whoever. Yeah, James, you can uh, free up your screen. Okay.